my name is Heather Martin Dutka. Um, I am a new director with the Historic Society, um, and my historical interests are in those everyday lives of everyday folks. Um, as said, I am also a hobby gardener, so when those two interests collide, you get an interest in Victory Gardens, um, which is what we will be talking about today. Um, so today we are going to cover, first, um, we'll quickly go over what a Victory Garden was, and this will be like a super quick definition. Um, next, we will go through advice from 1942 um, with the column Today's Victory Garden Graph. Um, and then lastly, we'll go over some tips for a garden in 2024. So what was a victory garden? Um, victory gardens, otherwise known as war gardening, were vegetable plots planted across Canada during the Second World War. Um, and this was inspired, or at least in part, by a similar patriotic mobilization during the First World War. Um, so as Ian Mosby, who literally wrote the book on um, victory gardening states victory gardens were an important part of both the symbolic and material mobilization of civilians on Canada's home front and although their contribution to overall food production was sometimes um, exaggerated both during and after the war um, victory gardens were a great example of that patriotic citizenship on the home front so here we have um, a ad from the Lethbridge Herald, March 4th, 1942. We are getting into a local context here. And this is when we first see the term Victory Garden show up in the Herald. Um, yeah, in this advertisement um, for an initiative led by the Lethbridge Boy Scouts Association to collect seeds to send to Britain um, so that they could produce um, their own Victory Gardens over there um, in Britain. So again, just getting into that local context. And as this ad suggests, Victory Gardens were seen as a patriotic activity, um, a form of wholesome and patriotic leisure, as Mosby states. Um, so again, from Mosby, the home food production was already a common practice in rural Canada, and therefore victory gardens were largely an urban phenomenon. Uh, the ideal victory garden was one that transformed urban land into agricultural space. As mentioned before, victory gardens were not a new phenomenon. Uh, war gardening was encouraged during the First World War, and urban community war gardens were rebranded in the 1930s during the Great Depression, and they took off as relief gardens during that time. Um, which meant, or and these relief gardens were meant to give the unemployed workers a sense of purpose and to boost morale. These urban gardens um, were once again rebranded at the start of World War II as Victory Gardens. So while community gardens were promoted, Victory Gardens were most commonly um, grown among better off urban homeowners. According to the most extensive wartime survey of wartime Victory Gardens, 82% were being cultivated at the home of the householder. 15% were in a nearby vacant lot, and only 3% were in community gardens. So again, just bringing us back to that local context, um, this is from an August 1942 article, and two victory gardens were mentioned as being awarded prizes by the Lethbridge District Horticultural Society. First was the garden described up on the slide here, that of Walter Gurney, um, a regular winner at the horticultural show, and he was later known for his taxidermy museum. Um, and second, quoting from the article, was the delightful victory garden at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Viney at 639 8th Street South, which won first place for the best small vegetable garden. Great care had been spent in laying out this plot, which had produced vegetables of outstanding merit. 
And so uh, Gurney's um, garden is in the is number one there, um, and it's nice and grainy because I found this um, on online from a scan version because it was too cold to go outside while I was researching this. So gardening advice for city folks, um, not only was the typical victory garden usually planted on private property, as we can see exemplified by the article in the previous slide, um, but they were also often being tended by inexperienced gardeners. As reflected um, in the prescriptive literature about victory gardens, um, which was aimed towards guiding the new gardener. One such example of this prescriptive gardening, gardening literature um, was the column in the Lethbridge Herald called Today's Victory Garden Graph. Today's Victory, or sorry, Today's Garden Graph, as it was named from 1936 to 1940, um, or the Daily Garden Graph, as it was called in 1941, was a seasonal column um, attributed to Dean Halliday, and it was distributed by the Central Canadian Press, or the Central Press Canadian, or the Central Press Association, depending on what year you were reading. It ran in the Lethbridge Herald previous to World War II, um, and it gave a daily gardening tip, whether it be about like lawn care, you know, how to have turf, not just grass, um, or uh, planting seeds um, or critters, like there was an article on the celery caterpillar. Um, and with that tip, it came with um, an accompanying drawing or graph. Uh, the column it became today's victory garden graph in the 1942 season with a focus on gardening for subsistence. So through the 1942 season, the fruits, vegetables, and herbs promoted through the column could fall under four main categories. Nutrition, economy of space, flavor enhancing, and winter use. And this is just an example of one of the graphs in the graph part of GERD graph. So first, there was a heavy emphasis on, as it said, high vitamin and mineral bearing vegetables, specifically those with vitamin A for vision, bone growth, cell function, reproduction, and immunity, vitamin C for skin, bone, and con connective tissue health. Um, it also promoted, he, promotes healing and helps absorb iron. Um, vitamin B1, which is also thiamine, um, which is used for cell functions. And vitamin B2, also known as riboflavin, which is important for body growth, um, red cell production, and the release of energy from protein. And so these were just some of those nutritionally dense um, vegetables that were highlighted in the, in the article. So there was lettuce, carrots, parsley, soybeans, tomatoes, Swiss chard, endives, and kale, just to name a few. And so this is an example of one of the columns. Um, and this one is dedicated to soybeans. Um, and so early on in the growing season, today's Victory Garden Graph um, would often have um, like, a, it would be about a certain plant and it would be why you should plant that plant. And often why is because it had good nutritional value. So as we see here, soybeans are full of vitamins and they are lacking starch, thus making them perfect for diets. Uh, the dried soybean contains 40% protein, the highest quality. 15 to 20% of an excellent fat. They have almost no carbs and are a large source of vitamins B and G. And that should probably say C. Um, so the next thing is that, um, er, I guess the next theme is economy of space. So as the column often points out space, is a factor um, in planning a garden um, in, in an urban environment. Your yards are small. Um, gardening in a limited space was addressed in several ways via the column. So first, being conscious of how you're using your space, highlighting crops that could be continuously harvested throughout the growing season, successive planting using early, middle, and late crops, and highlighting fruits and vegetables that could be used in multiple ways, so eat, whether eaten raw, cooked, or preserved. 
and again just an example of Swiss chards. They're great for a long growing season. So the first example um, of a conscious use of space that I have here is the um, espalier fruit trees. Um, so when growing or when gardening in a small space, you have to be conscious of the size of the plants you're choosing. Um, and the column also, or often had articles where they highlighted um, the importance of choosing a dwarf variety, as well as the importance of pruning and training your plants, um, because otherwise they can get a little unruly. So um, these espalier um, dwarf trees, um, they came um, and they had an entire column devoted specifically to these, these trees. Um, they take up less space um, than other varieties and they came in a variety of fruits such as apple, pear, plum, peaches, nectarines, cherries, quinces, and apricots. Um, other dwarf varieties that were mentioned um, or plants with dwarf varieties were corn and basil and lavender. So again, you just wanna choose something small because you got a little piece of land. Um, when it comes to pruning and training, the example I have up on the slide is of tomato plants. So while I personally leave my tomato plants to sprawl out um, simply due to that low effort aspect of being um, a hobby gardener, uh, the column promoted training your tomato plants as it claimed that this speeds along ripening and the tomatoes are usually larger and better colored. And then, yeah, the graph here is of those teeny little, teeny little fruit trees. Um, so another way the column suggested consciously using limited garden space was to plant vegetables that can be continuously harvested throughout the season. The, ra the rationale being that if you could continuously harvest a single plant, you would need to have fewer plants and thus less space dedicated to that crop. So there were leafy greens like lettuce, Swiss chard, and New Zealand spinach, um, where the column stated that um, some gardeners never pull up or cut off the loose leaved varieties. Instead, they pull off a few of the outside leaves of the plant, which allows the center leaves to continue growing for future use. There were also vegetables like bean pole, or pole beans, which had long yield periods compared to the bush varieties that would otherwise take up less space. Um, and then the column also pointed out that many of the plants pulled out while thinning could be used for the table, such as Swiss chard, lettuce, beets, carrots, and turnips. And so of course up here we just have some examples of, of the column talking about what you could do with the lettuce or what you could do or why you would choose a pole bean instead of the bush bean. Um, and then again, turnip thinnings are delicious as boiled greens. Who knew? Um, successive planting, so while some crops could be continuously cropped, um, the column also suggested successive planting, so whether using a plant that matured quickly or using a later crop um, where the ones that like were where earlier ones were finished, there we go. Um, so peppers, turnips, and kohlrabi, um, which are all up on the slide there, were all examples of what they called fill in or follow up crops, which can be planted where early seeds fail to come up or follow an earlier crop. Other crops suggested for successive planting were corn and beets. Um, as leafy greens are often a cool crop, the column began promoting those once again uh, later in the season. And yeah, so again, peppers. That's a later crop. Um, turnips, they said right here, that's the fill in, the follow up. And same with the kohlrabi. So um, the next was um, gardening with vegetables um, that could be used 
in more ways than one. So whether it was eaten raw or cooked or preserved. So in these columns, they highlighted vegetables that could be eaten raw or cooked, um, like kale or um, Jerusalem artichoke or cauliflower, uh, vegetables that could be preserved, pickled, canned. Um, so that would be like tomatoes, peppers, beets, and I think most delightfully, the column highlighted all the ways that fruit, such as raspberries, blackberries, dewberries, and gooseberries could all be used. So that was eaten raw or made into pies, jams, and jellies, which I think is the best. So uh, the next theme was um, planting for flavor enhancement. So butter, sugar, meat, coffee and tea were all rationed during the Second World War um, and herbs were promoted through two days of Victory Garden Graph as they made cheaper foods palatable and enhanced and improved salads. So uh, Again, to make some of those cheaper foods palatable, the column highlighted herbs like chives and basil and tarragon. Um, even better was if the herb could be planted in a pot or used decoratively as edgings or borders, such as chamomile, burnet, parsley, dwarf basil, and dwarf lavender. Flavorful alliums and bulbs like shallots, leeks, and garlic were also promoted in the, or in the column. And scented geraniums, an edible flower, were also promoted not only for their beauty and scent, but because of their culinary uses. An entire column on geraniums specifically stated that a leaf laid in the bottom of a glass of apple jelly adds a pleasant spicy flavor and leaves, bruised, are also used to flavor puddings, custards, and jellies. And last but not least, um, the column focused on fruits and vegetables that could be stored for winter use, such as turnips and parsnips and beets and carrots and rutabagas and onions and potatoes and salsify. And again, it was even better if these could be successively planted so that the thinnings could be used for the table or if they could be preserved in other ways. So we're not going to go over every single one of these listed on the slide, but from April 4th to October 10th, 1942, 36 vegetables, seven herbs, 13 fruits and one flower were mentioned in the Victory Garden Graph. So now we're going to talk a little bit about a Victory Garden for 2024. So many of these themes from the two days Victory Garden Graph column are relevant today. And most, if not all of the vegetables mentioned in the column have varieties recommended for the prairies. Your own garden this year might very well be inspired by the urban gardeners of 1942. Before you get started, you may want to ask yourself, what kind of gardener are you? According to Roger Vick in his book, Gardening in the Prairies, there are two basic approaches to vegetable growing, whether you are a hobby grower or a substance grower. So you might want to ask yourself, are you looking for, you know, adding an extra source of vitamins to your meal? Are you looking for a way to add a little flavor to that less expensive cut of beef? Um, are you looking for a number of ways that you can use whatever you inevitably grow too much of, whether eaten raw, cooked, or preserved in a few different ways? So first is the hobby grower. Um, the hobby grower tends to try for a wide range of vegetables, mainly for the pleasure of seeing and tasting a little of everything that, be, that can be grown in the home garden. Typical crops for this garden are um, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, celery, um, sweet corn, eggplants, peas, tomatoes, and early potatoes. Um, some of these have little stars beside them, and those are um, vegetables that are listed in the book Lois Hole's Vegetable Favorites. Um, Lois Hole is, you know, Alberta's gardening guru. Um,
subsisten oh my goodness, subsistence gardening Ooh. Um, considers um, economic first or economics first um, and will always limit production to the veggies that are easily grown in quantity and readily stored or preserved. So that would be things like rhubarb, carrots, potatoes, beans, Swiss chard, beets, rutabagas, turnips, and cabbage. And again, the starred ones are Lois Hole's favorites. So if she likes it, then I like it. Um, so regardless of what Roger Vick says though, grow what you want. If you are more of a hobbyist, don't be afraid to grow any of these up on this slide. Um, just be aware, just know that you may be eating them for a while and you may have to come up with creative ways to use them. And I speak from experience. I had so much Swiss chard last year that I ended up using it as a bouquet for the table. And I only had two plants, so yeah. Um, according to, like I said, our gardening guru, Lois Hole, most herbs do best in full sun, meaning that they need at least five hours of direct sunlight per day. And most herbs are more drought tolerant than vegetables, basil being a notable exception. Herbs should um, not be allowed to dry out, especially during those early stages of growth. So keep that soil moist, but not wet. So herbs mentioned in today's Victory Garden graph that are easy to grow according to Lois Hole are um, chives and parsley. Ones that require a little more work are tarragon, lavender, and basil. And as she says, the ones for the adventurous are garlic, peppers, chamomile, and burnet. Um, so economy of space is just as much of an issue with urban gardening in 2024 as it was in 1942. But square foot gardening is now the garden layout of choice compared to rows. Um, as this image on, or as the second image shows, um, it comes from a 2022 blog post by Janet Melrose and Cheryl Normando. Um, these are the authors of the Prairie Gardener's Go-To series. Um, and they highlight here in the, in the um, blog post that uh, pole beans and succession planting are still the way to go. So, you know, timeless, uh, as they say, um, where did the word go? Oh, tried and true techniques. Yeah, timeless techniques. And also that image is just like super cute and I may or may not be using it for my own inspiration this year. Um, if your gardening space is limited um, at home, you might also be interested in participating in a community garden. According to Active Lethbridge's website, there are eight community garden spaces in the city. So something you can always take a look into. Um, so 2024, as we've been hearing, um, is probably going to be a pretty dry year. Um, we can borrow this watering tip um, from today's garden graph. One method of watering is to make a V-shaped trench a few inches from the plants, then allow water from a hose to flow slowly or trickle into the trench until the plant's roots are thoroughly soaked. If you're not into digging a little trough, um, Salisbury Greenhouse has some water saving tips from 2021. So just remind yourself that plants need one inch of water a week. Use a soaker hose right on that soil to help um, keep away any of that like uh, evaporate, evaporating. Um, same with uh, using mulch, two to three inches of that. Um, they also have a tip that don't use fertilizer without water. If it's dry, don't fertilize your plants because um, larger plants need more water. And if there isn't water, then it's scentless and, and pointless growth, they say. Um, they also say, consider planting varieties with a proven drought tolerance. So some zone four water savvy edibles from the book Water Smart Gardening um, are asparagus, currants, garden sage, garlic, melons, and thyme. And um, a couple seep irrigation techniques. And you know, these are not you know, new technology. These are even more tried and true than our um, other, other techniques that were shown. Um, but these are um, 
deep pipe irrigation and buried clay pots. And again, this is to help minimize that evaporation and runoff. And it also helps promote deep root formation. Um, so at this point, you know, you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I have so many questions. What are these prairie safe varieties? And I say, as a librarian, I, I can't even say it. As a librarian, I am professionally obligated to tell you to check out your local library or your favorite bookstore for books that will tell you all about it. Um, there are a few books in the references. Um, like I said, I personally feel you can't go wrong with anything by Lois Hole, um, but Melrose and Norman Dewar also, they've got a really great series there. Um, your local library will have all kinds of books on vegetable gardening, gardening in the prairies, and books to help you plan a drought tolerant garden. Oh, and I also wanted to just plug that Lethbridge Public Library has a seed garden, or sorry, a seed library. So if you um, want to test that out, I'm pretty sure their website will say more, but I'm pretty sure that just at the end of the season, they just ask you bring some seeds back um, from the plants that you grew from the seeds that you borrowed. Um, if your book, or sorry, if books can't answer your question, there are knowledgeable people out there. So whether that's your favorite greenhouse or the horticultural society here in town, um, I did just have a link here to Green Haven's plant search tool, which is pretty helpful. Um, but of course, the horticultural society is like who you would legit ask questions about plants. Not me, I'm just a hobby gardener. And that is that. These are my references. Um, and it's mostly that article from 1942. And there we go.